When you speak in the afternoon, you arrive at the lectern and there are four glasses of water sitting here, so I have to decide which one's going to be mine. Right. I'll get you a fresh one. No, I've got it, I've got it. It's a huge pleasure to be here in Dublin and I'm enjoying listening to everybody very much and there's such pace and dynamism. And the really good news is that you are so willing to talk about women in construction because it's not so long ago when if you wanted to talk about the impact of gender equality on performance in the built environment, for example, you could clear a conference room in about three nanoseconds. Everybody would hurtle for the hills, they disappear, go and do their emailing and their, their messages. But now there's a real desire to actually talk about it. But what I'm going to do is talk about what I've seen that works. Because I think we all know the stats, we all know the 50% of the population bit and we need them and there's a skill shortage. And I think the really important thing to focus on is what we can do to make a difference. So I'm going to talk about the slump test, addressing the gender mix in your firm, but I'm gonna do it with practical examples. But before I even start doing that, are you all sitting comfortably? Are you all ready for a little story? Because I'm going to do a once upon a time moment. Right, once upon a time, there was a very, very beautiful bridge. This was Waterloo Bridge in London. And it was designed by the very famous engineer, John Rennie. And it was painted by the great masters of the day. People wrote poems about it. The day it opened, the great and the good from around the capital all turned up in their carriages and promenaded over it. And it's still said to be the best view in London, if not in England. But something began to go wrong. It began to crumble a bit, and then it was decided to knock down London Bridge and replace it. And the effect of this was that the River Scour worked away at the piers of Waterloo Bridge, and it began to crumble. They had to shut it. So roll forward a few years, and we're into the Second World War, and it's decided something must be done to rebuild this bridge because it's of strategic importance. But there were no people to work on it because the Irish workforce disappeared, it was the war, everything changed. They were so desperate to rebuild this bridge, they brought in the good fairies to do it. And there you can see them. They were so desperate, they employed women. And not a lot of people know this, but Waterloo Bridge was rebuilt in the Second World War by a workforce that was 70% female. And they did a very good job. They built it. Nobody knew who they were. And when the Prime Minister of the day opened the bridge to great fanfares, Mandelson's granddad, it was. He said, history will always remember the brave men who rebuilt this bridge. Now, one of my little targets is to get a pluck on the bridge saying it wasn't built by men, it was built by women. So why did nobody know who they were? It's because they didn't expect to see them. You didn't expect to see women building the bridge, so you didn't see them building the bridge. And we tracked down Peter Lynn's daughter, Peter Lynn were the contractors, and she says she remembers seeing these women, but they all wore the typical sort of kit you wore in the Second World War. You had dungarees, your hair tied up in a scarf, you weren't allowed to get very close anyway, so you couldn't see them. So nobody knew they were there. Now, when I heard this story, it seemed to me that we ought to do something with it. So every year for the last seven years, I and a crowd of volunteers from a group I'm involved with called the Association of Women in Property, we're a very broad church. It's, you can join provided you do something in the property world. So we have lawyers, we have accountants, we have civil engineers, we have architects, we have town planners. And we take a group of 120 12-year-old kids 
from a pretty challenging school in Vauxhall, and we walked them from their school to the bridge. The reason we walked them there is because if you walk 12-year-olds that distance, they're a bit more manageable when you get there. They're my legs hurt, miss, and so on. We get them to the bridge, and there we give them how to build a bridge in three easy lessons. They're always fascinated by compression joints. I don't know why, but the whole thing about this bridge moving. We then walk them back for the same reasons we walk them there. And then I have a panel of three or four women working in the industry who talk about what they do in their day job. And the kids can ask any questions they like. The first question is usually, how much do you earn? and what car do you drive, that's fine. But we begin to get these kids thinking about all the things they can do. And these kids are a motley lot, and they love it. You can see a mixed bag there, it's boys and girls. But what is interesting, it's the women telling them what they do. And they, it changes their attitudes. We ask them what they think, and we get brilliant feedback, like I found out I don't have to go to university to be an architect. I figured out that I can do an, go and do an apprenticeship. I know how much you can earn as a plumber. And I also give them a little list of, I'm a, I'm a compulsive bridge lover, so we put lots of pictures of bridges up and we get them to react. We ask them who they know who work in construction. And last year, a young boy went to one of the teachers, or they now have a teacher in charge of the built environment. And he said, I've been thinking, miss, and I've decided I'm gonna be an engineer. And she said, why is that? And he said, it's because of what these women told us, what came last year. And that was worth it, and we know that happens. So it's all about storytelling. And this is what I think we need to focus on in our industry. We've heard a lot already about it's the image, it's what people think. Would you, give your, would you let your daughter or son work in the industry? And yet everybody working in the industry loves it, as far as I know. Do you enjoy it? Are you happy in your work, people? Who's really happy? Show of hands. That's better. OK. Right. I've got another question coming up in a minute. Now, when I started doing this, which is a long time ago in the days of Latham and Egan, I didn't call my presentations Improving Gender Equality in the Built Environment. I used to have titles like Dirty, Dangerous, and Dominated by Macho Men, or age, sex, and leadership, because I soon found out that if you have something called age, sex, and leadership, people don't go, they stay, because they want to hear what you're going to say. We're talking about age. I just talked about kids. The next stage is important. This photograph was taken two weeks ago, and this is a picture of the finalists of the Women in Property Student Awards Programme, which we started 10 years ago, and it's now grown to the point that we have 132 finalists. It works like this. We go to universities and colleges, and we say, nominate the woman working in any built environment discipline who you think is really good, and then she has to put forward a presentation. This year we had 132 finalists from 58 universities across the UK. And then we had a best of the best dinner with the 14 finalists. <coughs> and the young lady there, bottom right, Katie McManus, who's doing quantity, quantity surveying at Sheffield Hallam, is the winner. But do you know the best thing about this? Every year at Claridge's, where we have the best of the best dinner, I have this wonderful site of all the big employers in property in the UK fighting over who's going to employ these finalists. And these young women have ended up with placements in Australia, job opportunities, work, shadowing. They all get jobs, but the important thing is they are seen as really valuable, and the word gets back. So we've talked about kids, we've talked about students, who recognizes any of the women on this slide? This is your starter for 10. This is the first round of the University Challenge. Just shout out if there's anybody you recognize. No? Sorry? Can't hear that. Dame Anne. Yes, thank you. That was You're right. The that was the lady. That was yes, the lady. thank you very much. 
I call them pioneers because these women are all presidents of our learned institutions. And after 150 odd years of these institutions like the civils and the mechanicals and uh, the structural being led by men, presidents, we've had this flurry, this explosion of women at the top. And I thought, what's going on here? Why have we suddenly got these women at the top of these professional, hallowed institutions? So I analyzed them. The common denominator of all these women, bar two, in the last two years, they all run their own businesses. So my question is, is the only way to get to the top to be in total control? Now we listen to Tara. Tara, you're in control, aren't you? You run your business. And here you are, heading CIF West. Yep. I couldn't have done Latham, Egan, Constructing Excellence, Andrew Walton Home, a Masters in Construction Law, three kids, keeping a husband happy, running a business, unless I'd been running a business, because I didn't have to ask permission to attend. So what is it that stops women progressing? We're the industry that makes reinforced concrete ceilings, not just glass ones. So is there something about the corporate world that's holding people back? Now, the change has been in the last two years, and that is Amanda Clack, right middle, who has just stepped down as president of the RICS in the UK, and Faith Wainwright, Arabs, who's about to become structural, structural engineers. Now, does anybody recognize her? Yes, because she's one of yours, isn't she? <laughs> Angela Brady who was president of the RIBA and who studied in Dublin and then went to the UK. So is another question. Do you have to leave home to be successful? I'm often at meetings and the women on the platform don't originate from the place we're sitting in. They've come from outside. It's this leaving, leaving to find success. Margaret Conway, any ideas? First construction manager, female, last year, of my lot. I'm Chartered Institute of Building. Great news. Sad thing is, this year, only one woman put herself forward. This woman, who's just taken over the Macquarie Bank. Now, the point of putting those two women there is that what we women are pretty rubbish at is putting ourselves up for positions and posts, because we're ever so humble, or something. So we need men as allies, but more importantly, we women need to do it for more women, because we don't do it for ourselves. And there's the classic joke about, if there are seven different ways of applying for a job, and a woman can only do six, she won't do it, whereas a man will wing it on two. So we need to do that. Who's your client? Oh, by the way, stats. I said I wouldn't give you any, but we're about 12.5% women in the construction industry in the UK, which is over, half, over double what you are. But I'm a bit twitchy about percentages. I prefer people. So if you work out 12.5% of the UK construction force, that's about 296,000 women, which is quite a lot. So there's a lot of us. So let's stop thinking small and think, wow, over a quarter of a million women. Clients are very important, and the client can be a woman. I set up a mentoring scheme when I was on the board of a construction company. We had nobody in the company who could mentor our rising stars, so I asked our clients to. And we had senior women in the, client, in the built environment, property, management, retail, who said, great, we're very happy to mentor your rising star. And we've talked about collaboration, and we've talked about communication, and we've talked about improved delivery. When your mentor says to you, we want to refurbish a high street store on a one-way street, and keep trading, and be finished by Christmas, the young woman she's mentoring, who is a project manager, can point out in the nicest possible way quite what a challenge that is 
for the industry to do it, and you begin to get toing and froing on understanding how the industry works. So the mentoring programs I help manage and run match people who are not the same, but are operating in the same field. So it might be an architect mentoring a lawyer, or a quantity surveyor mentoring an agent. And that way, we're going to start improving the communication in the industry. So look to your client. And the clients like to see a team that looks like them. And what is actually happening now in the UK is people who put forward teams that are pale, male, and stale are told not even to bother to proceed with their tender because they are not mirroring the client they've come to see. And that's happened twice in the last few weeks. Now, one of the problems with the construction industry is you can't wait to start, and when they start, you can't wait for them to finish. Now, I got fed up waiting for a builder last year, and that is me building my own fence. And I've slung that in just to prove the point that I'm not just a management consultant. I can build, and I'm a pretty good bricklayer too. So, the business case. Think of women as clients, not just workers. Don't bother to bid if you're pale, male, and stale. I mentioned earlier this morning in a question that Westminster Council are putting forward this proposal to include social return on investment, which can cover all sorts of things like training. In Australia, there is evidence that if you have one or more women on the board, you actually increase shareholder returns. And we know that there is also an increase in performance. So why not do it? It makes business sense. So, some tips. For women, don't get mad, get even. Offer solutions, not problems. When you're trying to negotiate how you're going to change the way you work, rather than demand something to sort out your problem, turn up with the solution. Really, really importantly, never underestimate what you know. It's very easy to get into the mindset that because you know it, everybody must know it. There's value there. So have a bit more confidence. Really importantly, hard facts. You've got to have hard facts and a sense of humor. So what about employers? Spot talent early. I've talked about a school outreach program there are student awards, there are fair assessment panels. Go out there with the stories that engage these kids. And if you do work experience or shadowing, get it organized well in advance. Otherwise, these poor kids turn up and somebody says, oh, who said he could turn up this week? Put him in accounts for a bit and give him some photocopying to do, and by Wednesday, we'll have sorted out something for him. Get, get it organized. And the other question I was going to ask you all, you seem relatively happy. How many of you in the room have the career you thought you'd have when you were 16? How many, right, there's only about six hands up. Now, I know you're a lawyer, but are the rest of you architects by any chance? Are there any architects in the room? Are you, did you expect to be an architect? No. So we've all fallen into this industry, haven't we? It's just all happened by some sort of strange mistake. So how are we going to really project why other people come in? So start, start thinking about it. Tell those stories. Really importantly, there's no point going out to primary schools and, and talking to the parents if when you get these people on board, you lose them. So keep, keep them, keep that talent. Flexible working, agile working. We've heard a lot today about technology. That surely must be one of the solutions to enabling people to work in a different way. Management training, career development. I deliver unconscious bias training. All this stuff is transferable. It's not just because we're talking women here. Unconscious bias training starts telling you, again, we touched on it earlier, fast thinking, slow thinking instinctive reaction, measured reaction, innovation. We'd never normally consider a geography graduate, for example, but look at them differently, change the lens, take on non-cognates, recruit from different areas. 
find different ways of training people. We've talked about housing as well. About five years ago, I worked with housing associations and registered social landlords and contractors because contractors said, we've got all these tendering re requirements. We've got to show we're contributing to the local community. We've got to show we've got a gender mixed workforce. We can't find them. So we said, well, we'll sit in a room and find out a different way of ticking the box. We ended up by offering housing association tenants basic maintenance and DIY training. Because the housing association says their biggest problem was dealing with fiddly little jobs worth 50 quid. The housing contractors said, we can help upskill the, the tenants. The tenants were running, literally running down the street saying they're going to train us to do something. The contractor could tick the diversity box. The housing association saved money. And some of these trainees went on to retrain and became quantity surveyors and project managers. So there's some thinking out of the box. And they were all women. We've got people from Durkin here, I think. Durkin were fantastic supporters when we dealt with a catch-22 of women on the tools. We could get women trained to a certain stage, and they couldn't get any further because they needed site experience. And we got in the catch-22 of come back when you're experienced, give me experience, come back when you're experienced. We found a pot of money. We said to contractors, we know it's a bit scary. You're behind time. It's pouring with rain. And now we're giving you women to work with. But we'll help you. We'll hold your hand. It'll be fine. And of course it was fine. The women turned up. Their jeans stayed up. They did a good job. They were hungry. They did a great job. And we had contractors saying, have you got any more? <laughs> I was talking last week to another group in Kent. And they're looking at doing uh, construction tool skills training to women in open prisons. Th these women are there for tiny, tiny reasons. These women are there who can only see a life stacking shelves in Tesco's. And if we can find a way of helping them develop a career. So there are different ways of, of thinking. Find your champions. I've had champions. We can all be champions for other people. Make your boardroom work. I'm a non-exec director. I talk to everybody in the companies I work for. I discovered the receptionist in the London office of the company I was on the board of was a trained CAD technician. Nobody knew because she was recruited to be a receptionist. So we started sending all the work down from the head office in Lincoln because we had too much work up there. She did it. She was upskilled. I did breakfast meetings where women talked about what they did and two women who were administrators retrained as quantity surveyors. Because you talk to people, we're back to people. We're back to the 296,000 that would like to have a bigger career. So look at your board. Are they interested in your people? Have they got crazy ideas? They've got nothing to lose. They're not watching their fronts. They're not watching their backs. They're not the marzipan layer of middle management. They're there to make the enterprise work. So look at your boards and watch for conscious and unconscious bias. So age, sex, and leadership. We're back to the saucy title. Age, engage the young. Recognize the mature. I've got vested interest in saying that now. Keep and value the ones you've got. Sex, watch the language. And I don't mean the saucy language. I think we've dealt with that. Figure out what we really mean about quotas and targets. There is a difference. We have to have a target. If you don't have a target, you don't know how you're doing. Manage the elephant in the room. Has anybody been to MIPIM? Do you, do you suffer the agonies of MIPIM? This year, they had people wandering around with pink elephants. So if there was any trouble with the infamous bad behavior at MIPIM, there was somewhere a woman could go and say, would you mind taking me back to my hotel? Uh, the President's Club has had a tremendous difference. And I think there's another change, which is more men have got wives who are not trophy wives. They're women with their own careers. And more men have got daughters who say, were you at the President's Club, Daddy? Do they really do that, and are they really hookers? So I think there is a social change that's going on. And we need leadership. We need leadership in the industry. We need leadership so we can communicate with the policymakers, with the politicians, and actually have an identity as an industry, because that's how we're going to make a difference. 
So I enjoyed meeting Sarah earlier, who I understand does the same as me, which is phone up and say, why don't you have any speakers on your panel? I must congratulate you on this event. You had women speakers on the panel, and you've got women on the floor. Fantastic. Keep on asking. And we need to speak up for construction. Now, I was delighted when I went round Trinity College yesterday, in the sunshine, to come across this embedded in the wall. And I thought, how well-timed is that? Emmeline Pankhurst, all those years ago, it was almost like a sign. If we win, win it, this hardest of all fights, then in the future it's going to be easier. And we are. The other interesting thing, and again you're ahead of the game here, I went in the National Museum of Art, and whenever I go into art museums, I go around all the galleries and I spot how many paintings have been painted by women. And you've got six, six women painters in the, in the 19th century. That's a prize winner. You're doing great. So, positively, I think you have here a competitive advantage in this issue about gender. You have a large number of private family-owned businesses, and I know from my own experience, they're the fleet-footed and the innovative, because you're not looking over your shoulder at shareholders. Make the most of it. As I understand it, you have a collaborative supply chain, and there's been a recent announcement by the UK government, like in the last two days, that 25% of the apprenticeship levy contractors can offer their supply chain. This is very new. So there's an opportunity there to do something innovative with apprenticeship. You're in a position of learning from the experience of others, and I have more examples. You've got a huge construction investment, and therefore a huge need. And we're in Dublin. We're in Ireland. If you can't tell the stories, nobody can. So you've got a lot going for you to make a difference when it comes to women in construction. Now, we started with kids, and we're going to end with kids. And this is the tip for the brilliant video that CIF made this year. Thank you for show you a video of a building that was recently built in Dublin. So this is the building in Dublin that's newly finished. It's got special white glass at the front and bronze shading at the back. Who likes the white glass at the front? <laughs> Who do you think could have built this building? Who put this building there? Builders? Okay. Architects, yeah. yeah. Then what do builders look like? They're very strong, quite big. Oh, yes. They have hard hats. And what do you think they were wearing on their feet? Boots. Boots. Black boots. Yeah. So now that you're seeing the video, I have a surprise for you guys. It was actually me who built the building. like to be a builder. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Sandy. It was a fantastic, fantastic speech. You said there, tell, tell their stories. Tell yours. Did you, you <laughs> ask everyone to put up their hand and say, are they where they expected to be? Where did you expect to be? I, how did you get here? How did I get here? Well, I suffered from a, what I call the traditional girls' grammar school education, where they stuck a label on your forehead when you were far too young to know yourself, and then sort of drive you in a, in a direction. And they told me I was going to study classics, 
And I said, what do you do with classics? And they said, well, you learn classics, and then you go to university, and you learn more classics, and then you go back to school and you teach classics, which struck me as being a sort of fairly sterile closed loop. And, and I, I didn't then know that you could do a degree and go and do something else with a degree. But I loved building things. My father was an engineer, my brother's an engineer, and my father taught me to saw and cut wood and build things and paint and decorate. I can hang wallpaper. I can, I'm a pretty good plumber's mate. And I loved it, but I couldn't see how that worked for a job. And so I became a civil servant, which was hell on wheels. And it took me about a year to escape. And I went to London and uh, joined what was then the biggest advertising agency in the world, J. Walter Thompson which was very exciting, and then I was offered a job on construction news. It was sheer luck, just one of those extraordinary meetings, and it was my eureka moment. And they were a great team, and the job I was taken on to do, I was doing two days a week, that somebody had done five days a week, so they said, oh, the other three days will teach you to do news, features, layout. And one of the things I wish I'd known was how to make better use of networks, because I look back and I was very young and I was getting through the doors of people like John Lang. And I just thought, oh, this is cool. I'm talking to John Lang and I'll write an article. And I didn't make the most of it. And I think that's something really important to recognize the connections you make. And, and that really was the turning point. And then I, we, I had a house and we, I did a lot of work on the house, but I became fascinated with the process. I think construction and civil engineering is miraculous. It sounds a, naive and a bit childlike, no, but, but it's, I think... It's the creation of something out yeah, of nothing. Exactly. And, and how you see this muddy site, and, and somehow it works. Maybe it takes a bit longer to make it work, but it works. And I think bridges are extraordinary structures. I think this is an extraordinary structure. I sat out eating my lunch overlooking the stadium. I was hoping maybe a match would start, but <laughs> never mind. Um, it's extraordinary that it works. And I think that's one of the things that we're not very good at. We're just so glad to get the job done, we move on. Yeah. And I think it's an extraordinary industry. And I'm only really happy with the smell of damp cement, really. I'm a bit compulsive. Let's just... do another project. I was really interested with what you said about there's an expectation among certain clients now that there will be a, a myriad views going into a pitch, that you can't just be everyone in their 50s, male yes. and stale and pale, as you put it. I mean, that really is probably whatever you can talk about, quotas and all of that sort of thing. But if the client wants a real diverse pitch, that's going to drive change much faster than anything else because it feeds down to the bottom line. Yes, the, cli the client drives it all, but I think picking up one of the comments earlier, which is a sort of classic definition of marketing, if we were gonna, going to be a really good industry, we shouldn't wait for the client to ask us. You know, shouldn't wait till you get back twice saying, wow, we, we lost that up, didn't we? We better find, a, is there a woman around who might do the job? I think that it's thinking about how you can give those diverse views, but also very importantly, make sure that everybody has a voice at the meeting. Um, I know when I used to um, interview teams for work, nothing was more frustrating than have maybe a group of four people and only two spoke. You know, if, if somebody's gone to a meeting, make sure everybody speaks. I wish they would have spoken. They'd have been so quiet. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a long room. But I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't wait for clients, and I think we should look. And we're all clients. We're all customers. I mean, one of the reasons for putting that silly slide of me up with a coolie hat and building the fence because the guy didn't turn up is because we are all customers. And, oh, that's the other thing I'd like to pick up with. Much talk of the car industry, and we've had this ever since um, Sir John Egan took over from Michael Latham and looked at improving the industry. There's this obsession that somehow the automotive industry is better. Well, I've been looking to buy a new car, and I can tell you now, their customer care and marketing is rubbish. So I think we must keep confidence and just keep saying, how are we going to do this better? How are we going to communicate? How are we really going to find out? Like the housing issue, what is it that people not only want, but we know they need? 
and who are the best people. And oh, and also clients. I mentioned Durkin, who, who were very proactive in our training scheme. What Durkin realized was that many of their customers in their housing pools were of a culture who would not let in a man to do work. So they had a business driver for having female maintenance teams. It makes, it makes business sense. That's the customer relationship. Or it's older people who would rather have somebody of a different type. And, and finally, you spoke about unconscious bias. Hmm. How big an issue do you think it is out there at the moment? I think it is a big issue, and we've all got it. I've got it. Oops, I forget, I'm all wired up here. Um, I suffer from unconscious bias. It's, it's partly intuitive. We're all wired to wonder who, who those people are coming over the hills with spiky things, and are they good or bad. So there is a, an intuitive, instinctive reaction to fast thinking. But I can make assumptions about a, a particular type of person, maybe the way they speak or the way they dress, and you find you slip in to this. And I talked about transferable skills. Um, I ran a, an unconscious bias session in Leeds with a group of senior managers from the property world. And I do it with a stand-up comedian who trained with John Bishop and is a neuroscientist and is very easy on the eye, if that's not too politically incorrect. So it's a very jolly training session. And one senior partner came up to me afterwards and said, I think I know what you, know, what you mean now about unconscious bias. He said, I've got a really difficult job at the moment. I have a very difficult client. It all keeps going wrong. And I got an email from this guy that made me really angry. And fortunately, I didn't do anything about it. The next morning, I printed out the email and I gave it to my colleague. And I slung it on the desk and I said, what do you think of that then? He said, my colleague picked it up. He looked at it and he said, oh, that's interesting. Oh, he's made a good point there. Oh, right, we're good to go then. And he said, I realized I'd reacted to that email with all my unconscious bias about what I felt personally about this guy, which completely distorted a perfectly reasonable commercial interaction. And that's, that's the subtlety of it all. It's learning that you need to really reassess why you're making the reaction, why you're assuming if somebody hasn't been to a particular university or hasn't taken land surveying, that they're not going to be good for the job. To, we won't ask her to go and set up the new office because she won't want to go because she's got two kids. And let me tell you, if you've got two kids, it's quite nice to get away and set up a new <laughs> office somewhere. So it's making those assumptions and then asking the questions. Sandy, thank you very much for joining us here today. Can I have a big round of applause? Great pleasure.